Hi. Hello. I think Hello. everybody wanted you to step to the front of the stage and go, showtime. <laughs> so I had, I had this plan. Hello, I'm Peter, by the way, in case you couldn't figure Yay. that out. Um, Can and, you believe it? And I had this plan, uh, uh, but then Bob took me aside and said, no, this is what we're going to do, and I've seen his work, so I'm not going to argue with him. <laughs> so the first question is, what is a xylot? Well, it's not pronounced xylot, Phil. Look at the cover of the book. There's a pronunciation guide. Well, look, it's zillet. That's what I thought, and then he said xylet. I know, and listen. And I thought you got excited. Phil, you're not alone. You're not alone, Phil. Are, um, you, are you sure it's not xylet? I'm not sure. We just invented the word, so, you know, we're still... Because it's, it's a book, so nobody said it out loud. It's a, you write it down, so we've never actually... Well, oh, maybe you should explain what it is and okay. where the term came from, so, and then... Uh, so, xylet is a word that this young man when he was much younger, said, when he was six, uh, we built a lot of, it, it's a word for a blanket fort, okay? A blanket fort, a blanket, two chairs, three chairs, a couple pillows, get, in, get inside, read books. And so we did that a lot. We built those a lot and used them in the evening before bed and did reading time in there. And we had a, a couple different fun things we would do and the cat would join us, you know. And one day, Nate came home from school, and he said, hey, let's build a zillet tonight. And I said, what's a zillet? He goes, you know, with a blanket and chairs and, you know, pillows. And I go, oh, you mean a blanket fort? And he goes, yeah, a zillet. All right, well, zillet is, that's a pretty cool word. It's got a Z. That's awesome already. And uh, it's no xylot. It's no xylot. But um, we all started to call it a zillet. We would just call a blanket fort a zillet, and I would say the line that is in the poem called zillet, which is, once we built it, I would say to the kids every time, um, hey, be careful when you climb in or you'll compromise the integrity of the zillet, <laughs> which is how I talk to my kids. <laughs> and, and, and then I would I've say- I've met them, I believe it. <laughs> I would say, well, you'll knock it over, but, um, so all this time, so the spelling of it just was what popped into my head. Now, I defend this spelling because English, the English language is filled with words that are not spelled the way they sound. You know, it's a tough, tough language, T-U-F-F. -F. <laughs> and and uh, so I'm, this is what popped into my head, that spelling, that pronunciation, and I'm gonna stick to it, I don't care what anyone says, Merriam or Webster, and the only thing we learned, do you want to share what we learned the other day, Aaron? Okay, yeah. So we learned the other day via YouTube comment that... Um, it's where I get do all my learning. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. It's good. The origin might be from the German word for tent, which is zelt. Yes. It's like, the closest thing we found. It makes a lot of sense. Yes. How so would, how, Nate, how did you come across at the age of six? The German word for tent. We think maybe one of his teachers or minders at Temple Israel of Hollywood, one of the older ladies, maybe had used the word. Made zealot. pillow forts. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and she called them fort. zealots. Yeah. But here's the thing. Also, Naomi, who's here. Let's hear for Naomi Odenkirk, who. She is, yes. Made the entire these family two kids is here. And raised these two kids and read to these two kids. And. Uh, she reminded me the other day that at, right around that very time, we had donated a, um, we had a little teepee that, you know, you put inside the living room yeah, or whatever, sure. and we had donated it to the school. So it's possible we had, you know, some one of the teachers called it a zelt when we yeah. brought it in and set it up. and Not uh, so much German as Yiddish then. Yeah, right. Right, okay. Right. And, uh, but, you know... Maybe that is where it came from. You know, it's interesting. One of the questions I had uh, was, I was going to ask Nate and Aaron what it was like to grow up with Bob as your father, but I think we all know now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so anyway, the reason this is relevant, this word that Nate made up when he was six, is because of this book. Yeah. So if, if, 
Any one of you who would like would explain what the book is and where it came from. Erin, I can't help but notice you're holding it out in a dem demonstrative way, so why don't oh, you yeah. take it? Yes. This, this that, that little book right there, which is, oh, I believe, wow. for sale in the lobby after this presentation. Thank you. Thank but go ahead, please. Um, so Zillit was, it's a book of poems for children that began uh, because when we were little kids, I was about four, five, six, Nate was maybe six, seven, eight, my dad or my mom would read us books before bed. Two or three short books. We read a lot of Shel Silverstein, Caliph Brown, Dr. Seuss, and then we would sit down and write a poem together. Um, and that poem became a collection of poems over the years. There's probably 60 or 70. And then cut to 10 years later, the pandemic happened. I came home from college. I had been making art in school and he came knocking on my door and he was like, let's put this girl to work. <laughs> and he rewrote some of the poems and I drew some drawings and slowly over the course of the next four years, it became this real book in front of you. Um, and we have the original today, but we'd love to read you some of the poems if that's okay. Yeah, is it okay yeah. if we just show you a sample? Okay. And there are so many that I love. Um, I'm going to read a different one, Aaron, than I've been reading just because I want to. And, uh, All right. Oh, this one's a ri this is one of the originals, which is to say it's almost identical to that, um, that little book that, of poems we kept. It's called Upside Right. <clears throat> a hat for my foot set on top of my shoe to keep the rain off it and when the sun's out, keep it cool. It's ridiculous, some have said, but not as ridiculous as the shoe on my head. Uh, and then, uh, let's see. Um, uh, this one's a good one. This is called Dress for Success. A raincoat's a garment for a rainy day. A sun hat's the garb to keep sunburn away. Pajamas are suits for going to sleep. A wetsuit's the clobber for exploring the deep. But wearing a swimsuit in a snowstorm that's freezing is not the frock, garb, or getup you want to be seen in. You'll be labeled a fashionable fool, a contradiction, for you'll be both cold and uncool. Uh, That's a good one. All right. uh, now I'm going to read one more that I just love very much. And uh, while I do it, um, let me see, where's later? I know you're thinking, only 80? Come on. That's like, pen, when, you, when you prorate the cost of the book, that's like pennies per poem. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pennies it is. per poem is actually my next book. You yeah. Go. Thank you for the shout out. Which will retail for $80. <laughs> this is called Later. Later is coming, make no mistake. Now will not help you to guess just how great it can be so much better than yester what's past. Don't look back, let's look forward. Later comes slow and then fast. Sometimes you may wonder, where's this later? It's late, I want later right now. I have no time left to wait. But that ant in your pants, I implore you, ignore it. Later's coming, I promise. Just stick around for it. Right. Sonny, you wanna there you go. knock sure. some out of the park? Uh, Nate, Nate, I am told you're up next. Sure, uh, thanks Peter. Let me see here. Uh, Okay, so this one is called uh, Party of One. The table is set, the chandelier is hung for my fancy extravagant party of one. Chairs are put out, the food's baked, broasted, and broiled. The silverware's polished, the lazy Susan's well oiled. No one's coming over, no hurt feelings, I'm delighted. I'll be reveling alone, no one else was invited. So why the big hubbub? Am I getting married? No way and we're 360 some days from my yearly birthday. In truth, I live simply. I eat no more than I'm able. I just love sitting at really long tables. <laughs> Thank you. This, and this is poetry you're supposed to, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very beat. <laughs> supposed to snap, right. Yeah. I was wondering, it didn't feel right. It didn't feel quite right. It was the snapping, it weren't snapping. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, well, so I, I, we hope you all buy the book. We hope you love it. But let's be honest, 
you know, you're, you're not everybody's going to love it. And so this is the return policy. <laughs> Unsatisfied with your purchase? You can return this book fast. Just follow our policy, no questions asked. The book must be sealed in unpopped bubble wrap, the whole thing vacuum packed, and please not booby trapped. The poems must be pristine and unread, not one single rhyme having entered your head. If it's store bought, return it safely in its original bag and wear the same underwear with its original tag. <laughs> your refund will be issued in the form of store credit, not for the store where you bought the book, the one where you didn't get it. Include the receipt signed by the store clerk and the pope and the queen, plus original artwork. Your return's nearly finished. You're one step away, and we sincerely apologize for any dismay. One last thing you must do, if you disliked it as much as you say, purchase two more copies for your worst friend's birthdays. It's foolproof. Yeah. Simple. And that's, Simple. And that's great. I just I copied and pasted from the Little Brown, Little Brown Book's yeah. return policy on their website and made it into a new poem. It's freaking great. It's amazing. Erin, I believe we turn to you. Yeah, I'm going to read a few from the original book. So like Ooh. I said, we read, we would read books at night and then write in this old book here, which my dad drew a little cover for. It's just any old notebook, but he called it Old Time Rhymes, which was, of course, silly. Uh, and it says, by Dad, Nate, and Aaron. And uh, it's just full of these like loose pages that weren't even from this book. He just did it on anything that was sitting around, any old piece of crap. Sorry. Um, so I'm going to read some that are probably most likely about me. One is called Comb Your Hair. Uh, I hated it when my hair got combed. Comb your hair. Ouch! It hurts. There are knits up there and knots and twists. Slow down, Dada. If you want to help, you're ripping my hairs out of my scalp. That was a good one. <laughs> Very expressive. That was more of a protest. <laughs> You're ripping my nerves. Um, okay, this is one that I haven't, I actually just found it while we were sitting here talking and it's making me smile. It has no title. What is she made of? A bunch of clowns who fell in love and were wearing gloves? Is she a giant shenanigan from the land called Bee Boo Bananigan? She is, <laughs> she is silly and a goof. She makes me crazy and jump through the roof and land on my butt. Oof. <laughs> It so just has to rhyme. That's, that's it. great. That's all you need for a poem. Oh my god. So let's start there. Tell me how that piece of paper came to be. You're a child, you're set, you're 7 or yeah, 8, I'm like you're four younger. Or five. 4 or 5. And we're sitting in Nate's room and there's a rocking chair and Bob's in the rocking chair or Naomi's in the rocking chair and they've just read to us. And then Nate's probably in his bed and Bob goes, "Aaron, you're being so silly. What are you made of?" You know, kind of teasingly probably. Uh, and then that starts the poem, what is she made of? And Nate thinks maybe a bunch of clowns and what rhymes with of. So is, is one of your parents, Bob or Naomi, sitting there with a piece of paper going, yeah. what are you made of? Yep. And you're writing down what yep. they say. Yes, and the, the key to that, hold on, Hunt, can you give me that poem? Yes. Uh, is that you write it down the way the kid says it. Like, I don't change it right away. Right. right? So in other words, that's where you get rhymes like oof. You know, um, what is she made of? A bunch of clowns who fell in love so, and were wearing gloves, I might say, like, what rhymes with love? And somebody says gloves or, you know, I go, and oh, so what about, and we're wearing gloves. Okay, great. Is she a giant shenanigan? And then somebody what says, rhymes with shenanigan? from the land called Bebo Bananigan. They, they, <laughs> you know, here's the thing, because we had just read like four or five books, yeah. right? And like Caliph Brown is a great example of what we read almost every night. He wrote uh, Dutch Sneakers and Flea Keepers, and they're rhyming books. Or uh, Dr. Seuss we would read a lot of. And, um, you know, the kids have that, you know, scheme in their head. You know, they have the rhythms and stuff. So they're, but the key is I would write down what they said. She is silly and a goof. She makes me crazy and jump through the roof. And I, I wouldn't, you know, and land on my butt. You know, a kid would have said that. And then, oof. I'm and starting to think maybe Bob wrote this last night. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah you it's, know. it's your handwriting. Yeah. It says well, Sher it Sheraton already... Chicago on it. <laughs> huh. I didn't know we used that letter. Okay, here's a good one. Here's a good one. Listen to this. And you'll know that you'll know what 
line that children wrote. What I learned at school. I learn, I learn, I learn a lot. I have fun with teachers and into tissues I blow snot. <laughs> I play with other guys who mostly are my size. I feed the fish and learn the rules. Don't push, don't shout. Stay in line, you lout. And make lots of friends at school. I wrote the line about being a lout, just so you know. Yeah, and that, that was all. That know, was all. I there. really wanted my. Uh, where did you grow up, Peter? I grew up in suburban New Jersey. Okay, I grew up in Naperville. Heard of it? And for me, uh, one of the big overcomes in life and in my career was just sort of having a simple belief that I had any right to voice my uh, ideas on people, uh, write something, be on stage and perform. And of course, I very much loved that, and that's what drove me, and I enjoyed it very much. But still, it was always this feeling of like, you know, imposter syndrome, but sort of on a bigger level of, I don't have, I, I almost can't conceive that this is possible. And so I felt like when you're reading to kids and they're seeing these books that are finished and professionally done, if you write something with them and you write exactly what they say down and they see their words go from what they said right onto a page and then it goes into a book with a cover on it and it goes on the shelf with the other finished books and it stays there and you add to it, I'm just trying to plant in them the feeling that I'm a part of this world of creation and presentation and um, on a somewhat professional level, I, I could one day do that. Um, I just think it's important because I think people are held back, you know, by imagining that it's possible to do that thing. And I, I part of this is too, in the course of my career, I've met young people who grew up in the business. I've met people who grew up in Hollywood or parents were famous. And while that can mess you up because you might feel in, totally entitled, that's a mistake, in many ways I saw that they had an advantage. And the advantage was they didn't question whether it was possible, they just asked how good can I be? But they didn't start from I have no right to do this. And that was neat, I couldn't believe that. I mean, you guys know some of the people I've worked with so you can, I don't wanna, bring other people's lives into this, but you just could see that they just didn't wonder if I had any right to do this. They just asked, what do I want to do? Well, I want to direct. And I remember friends of mine saying I want to direct and me going, what, who are you? You're not, you know, you, how would you direct? But of course, you know, one day you are the writers and you are the actors and you are the directors and it's important to just have that baseline belief it's possible. And that really was the impetus to do that. I, well, I guess seeing as they're here, we could ask, did it work? I, I've, I'm thinking I am seeing this book in like a Barnes and Noble and I'm still like, Damn, I wonder what I'm gonna do in my life. Like, <laughs> when I get back to New York, what should I should I go apply to that restaurant? So I think I will always struggle with some amount of like being unsure of who I am and what I should do and what I have the right to do. Um, but it's start it's starting to, you know, starting to sink in. Yeah. And uh, what was your memories of this experience that? Bob's talked about. Do you, do you, I mean, you were children, but you were obviously contributing. Do you remember doing it? Do you remember looking forward to it? Was it this weird thing your dad wanted to do, or was it the highlight of your day? Yeah, I remember. Uh, I, I, I'm kicking myself. I wish I had a specific memory to draw from, but really the anecdote I have for you is just it was, it was so much fun, and it was so cool, I think, to your point, to be taken seriously by an adult you know, like in, I mean, and you, 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 those rhymes are really, really silly, but you know, to have them written down, like that's to a kid, that's the coolest thing ever. Like an adult is like listening to you and then considering <laughs> your nonsense, like that's, that's amazing. And so my memory of Zillit is just feeling like I can be really creative and I have a lot of help 
in being creative too. And that was very meaningful to me. And, and it's obvious, uh, well, it did work because obviously you're an artist, Aaron, and you're living here in Chicago, Nate, uh, writing and teaching comedy, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, I write for a freelance writer. So that means I, I do a lot of stuff for magazines and stuff. It's, it's, I'm very lucky. And in a, in a way it, this is really, uh, Aaron and Bob's project. And I'm, I'm very, fortunate to have contributed in that in the way that I did. Yeah, here's um, how that went. Nate, I need 10 more poems. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm serious, totally serious. What happened was, out of that book, there are 13 poems that are originals that just sort of were good, you know? Maybe they needed a last you line. You mean 13 poems from, from that book, from the old book, right? That that's a solid thing. It's got a good idea. It's got a it's strong. Then there were another 15 that needed sort of everything. You know, the subject matter was good. The twist was good. Some of the jokes were good a little, but they needed work. Then there are another like 15 that were just the idea stolen and then completely rewritten. And then we, su we submitted that and we, um, Little Brown and MK Gaudette, our editor who's here, MK, thank you, uh, and she did a wonderful job, um, said, we need more poems. So we had 40, and I go, well, how many do you need? And she goes, well, 80? <laughs> and I was like, oh, Jesus. You want to bring the cost per poem down, again, returning to the theme of economy. But, CPP, uh, right, cost. get yeah, a low poem, CPP. Yeah. Cost per poem. Um, what is America's CPP right now? I, did they report on that? No, the Fed hasn't released the quarter three numbers yet. Yeah. No. no. Um, so. <laughs> oh, we got a great CPP report this morning. <laughs> yeah. I think I was I was listening to NPR. They were like, we're waiting on the Labor Department for the CPP report. You know. Yeah. Anyway. 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 Kai Rizdal. Um, okay. Not NPR. Not NPR. Sorry. Okay, I don't we're know. We're getting completely <laughs> off track. Come so on. they needed more poems to bring right. down the cost well, per poem. That's and when I knocked on Nate's door and said, start writing poems. But the truth is, we, we still had a lot to draw from that book. There's actually a lot of poems in that book. And um, so we still got ideas. And, and it was very helpful because the truth is, it, it was really hard to write poems for kids when you don't have a kid in the room to ask them what they did today or to say, you know, or, you know, just have had an experience with them that you can then go, hey, we did this thing today, let's write about that. And uh, it was actually really hard, Peter. Sure. Um, and, and what I was writing, right away, what I was writing were all these lectures. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Well, like... Like, put the phone down, look put, up, there's nature. The yeah, <laughs> just... <laughs> Exactly. Oh, here, here's a wonderful poem for kids called, Are You Really Going Out Dressed Like That? That's a little... <laughs> I mean, I really did that. I actually wrote, it's so funny you say that, Aaron. I wrote like a short story I thought would be part of it. And it was just the longest lecture about stop looking at your screen that you've ever read, <laughs> trying to be a fairy tale. Don't, I... don't write poems when you're mad. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. And I actually read these yeah. to, in our sort of, we'd have a bi-weekly, you know, uh, every other week session, bi-monthly session where we'd read our stuff to the editors. And I just knew when I got to like the fifth thing, like, oh, this, come on, this is not what kids want to hear. <laughs> so I... Yeah, I, would, I would be working on drawings as he was writing the poems. I've actually never said this. Um, and... Like he'd send them drafts, he'd send the drafts to me and I'd print them out and put them on my wall and pull them down and work on drafts of drawings. And we were kind of like both working on the words and the art at the same time. And the art for that one, I never put that, I like never even got to the pen stage because I kind of just knew in the back of my mind that it was not going to make it in the book. Yeah, because like, I mean, the, co the confidence pencil. that your father had given you through this gift allowed you to know this just bites. <laughs> I wasn't gonna and then, that. and then I walked up to his door. We need ten new poems. <laughs> All right, this it. this actually is, is, is leads to a question I, I genuinely wanted to ask, which is, you did this when you were small children. Yeah. Now you are adults. A, what was it like to revisit yourselves as children? Which is not something most people do. Most people, if they pull out the stuff they did as kids, go ooh, and they put it away. 
and secondly, what was it like to go from sitting with your dad when he was reading you bedtime stories in your jammies to being adults collaborating with your father on a book that will be published by Little Brown? In our jammies. In your yeah. jammies. Yeah. For old time's sake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My mic is... I think, I think you just can't hear it when you're up here. Okay. Out there. All right. Sorry. Um, it, it's remarkably sweet. I, we don't have a ton of photos from childhood because someone stole both of my parents' laptops when we were like four, five, six? Uh, seven. seven. Uh, yeah, that we lost everything. So sad. But we do have stuff like this, and we have some photos, some film photos, but this is a real like uh, treasure to look through, and the fact that I just found a new poem tonight is amazing, and thinking about words like shenanigans and bee boo <laughs> bananigans, like those are, those are the feelings that more than a photo can, because a photo, you look at it and you don't feel like that person anymore. It looks like you're looking at someone else's sweet relationship. But reading this, it feels so much like jumping back into those moments. Um, and working with him now was good, pretty much. It was hard <laughs> at times. <laughs> Just so you know, everybody noted the change in tone. Just then. It was, it was, like, it was like the key change in Born to Run. It was dramatic. <laughs> I, thank you. Um, I, it, was, it was good. It was, of course, a little stressful and a little, as he says, dangerous. Like, because he, I was 19 and he was, eventually we were putting our stuff out there for people to buy or not buy. And then once it was purchased, now it's out there for people to judge or not judge. And there's Amazon comments about it and YouTube comments about it. And I'm 22 and that's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a big change in my life that he was sort of putting me up for um, a rejection, basically. But I, uh, it's been good. It's been sweet. And to spend so much time with him at this point in my life has been really, really wonderful. And no words. You brought it home. That was great. Nate, you are professionally a comedy writer. Um, I don't know how many people know this now because Bob has become so well known as an actor, but he before that was a legendary writer of comedy. Really? Yes. <laughs> he was. He was. He was really like. Right. It's true. Knock knock. He actually and he. I, I wanted to ask you this because it just so happens Bob and Aaron were on my radio show a little while ago, and and Bob told a story, and I wanted to ask you about it, Nate, about you. That at one point you came to him and said, "Dad, these are my favorite shows." And God damn it, you star in all of them. <laughs> and, and it was annoying to you. Yeah, yeah, that's... I mean, you know, ver kind of verbatim. That was, yeah, yeah. was kind of it. I, I, yeah, you know, you, you, you get the classic teenage angst, and then you mix that with this incredibly specific problem. Um, <laughs> like, really, I, 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 I can't even talk about it with a therapist, you know? That's how specific it is, is it's like, well, there's no manual for that. <laughs> um, no, it, it, it doesn't bother me in the slightest a anymore. Um, <laughs> because it's the water that I swim in. Right. So, yeah. and, and you were involved in this book. That, like, yeah. This is your material. So yeah. you were collaborating with your dad on a project. Have you done that before? Well, we just did uh, another project last year called Summer in Argyle. It was an audible project. That was a lot of fun. Oh, my God. Thank That's you. That's nice. Right. Thank you so That's much. That's incredible. It's great fun. It was so much fun. And that was a true co-billing Nate Odenkirk and Bob Odenkirk present Summer in Although Argyle. Nate wrote the entire first draft, 73 pages of a story, essentially like a really loony um, Garrison Keillor type, you know, small town, Midwest thing. And also it would be like Garrison Keillor meets Fireside Theater. I don't know if you know those two references. Um, but, uh, and that's what he wrote just on his own. And he went to uh, show it to me and he, was gonna, he said, I'm gonna do this with my friends. And I said, this is pretty funny stuff if you're willing to rewrite it until you hate it. I said this. Right. Then we could try to sell it to Audible or somebody. No, hold on. Yeah. What did you mean by that? I meant he was, f look what I did, Dad. 73 pages, multi-chapter story, loony as can be. But I just knew that 
I didn't want to take the joy out without first checking, do you mind if we take the joy out of this for you? <laughs> but I was trying to say, you're going to have to rewrite it to the point where you might be mad, whereas right now you're super happy. And you could just go do it with your friends. Not and mad with the product, but mad with no, the No, just like, oh, it's not good enough. Now I got a collaborator who says you got to put more logic in it, and it doesn't, it's not grounded enough, and you have to think about that line again, and maybe it could be a little funnier. It's still a really loony thing. I mean, it's insane, but, you know, ground it more. See if you can deliver on some of the plotting of it. And I just was... It's a hard thing to ask a kid who doesn't really know what they're signing up for, but I was basically sort of trying to plant a little protection for me if, you know, two months later he was I going, so. I don't care. I don't care, Dad. I just want to do it. And I could say, you, I, I told you you were going to be mad, and you're mad now. You have to finish this. Um, so I knew it needed more logic to it, and... In the end, he never got mad and seemed to very much enjoy exploring it, trying to ground it more, and then the whole process of, uh, of recording it, which was very complex because it was an old-time radio play with sound effects and performances. And it was all done during the pandemic, so people were in their home studios, and he had to attend every direct. He directed it, which is hours and hours of work, but he just did a marvelous job on that. I mean, oh, thank look, you. the truth is, it is challenging and risky to make a project with your kids, just like it would be to start a business with your kids. And with Aaron, um, it, was a, it was more risky to feel that she might, get, she might get told you're not good enough. And one of the other concerns I had was every celebrity writes a kid's book, you know, and if all these Odenkirk names are on the front, they're gonna, people are going to go, oh, yeah, your family's so special. <laughs> I know. Aren't they, darling, your kids? Oh, they're so smart. I'll yeah. be honest, I had that reaction. Really? Yeah. You yeah. saw it in the bookstore, yeah. you said, those people, they think yeah, they're authors because they're famous. Odenkirks, yeah, what are they, Zylet? What? I don't know. Yeah. You know, I think we had good. to ask ourselves as hard as we could, what's good in here, really genuinely of value. I mean, I just love the fact that Erin's artwork, in, in the course of developing it, she found a style, color palette, that I think really suggests the feelings in the poems. Uh, if I can just say very quickly. Of course. The, uh, and I think I can say this as someone who uh, helped have a hand in writing it. To me, the highlight is the illustrations. They're really. Yeah, they are really good. I agree. I agree. Really yeah. amazing. I, I agree with him. I agree with Nate. I mean, uh, thank yeah. you. Um, Very sweet. Th it, it is. T we've arrived at the part of the uh, evening where we have audience questions. These have been pre-submitted and uh, and sent to me. And there's actually a wonderful uh, segue into them. This was a question from um, Alicia, who comments on the relationship that seems obvious between Aaron and Bob, because I think probably. Uh, he, she mentions hearing them on my radio show and presumably some of the other appearances you've done. And then she goes on to say, so I want to know, Bob, what is something you learned about Aaron as an adult and as a peer that super surprised you? And Aaron, is there something about working with your dad as a colleague, seeing him as a peer rather than a dad that surprised you? And I imagine this question also extends to Nate. Uh, Alicia does... F <laughs> Thank you, Alicia, and I'll, I'll add this in because you sent it in. Uh, she says, as a pinko liberal daughter alienated from her Trump voting dad, I salute you both. <laughs> so clearly, I think, and I, I know where you're coming from on this, Alicia, I think she's looking at your relationship and feeling a kind of, oh, if only. So what do you think? I don't, it's a complicated question. We've been asked a few times that I never have a really good answer. I think... I didn't stop seeing, like I see him as a peer, but I didn't ever stop seeing him as my dad. Like I don't think that those things were exclusive, like could be separated really. I have tried to start calling him Bob um, in professional settings, like in emails and when we're talking with our editor um, or if he's not paying attention to me and I need to get him to look at me, I go, Bob. <laughs> and he's like, what? 
Um, but <laughs> maybe if he's not, we'll use his middle name too. Yeah. That's when he knows he's Robert really John, in trouble with Robert us. Robert John Odeker, yeah. get over here. Yeah. Um, but I don't like. I feel like what was so actually cool about this process is that I was invited to hold my own and be seen as a peer while still being uh, a daughter and like having that daughter parent relationship. Does that make sense? It does. Actually, it's a weird way. It's like recapitulating as an adult what you guys did as a small child, was Nate was talking about. Like, oh, wow, they're listening to me. Nate, do you have uh, a comment? Yeah, I'll on that? say quickly that um, I realized working with him in a professional capacity that I never really got uh, any. I thought dad jokes were hilarious. Um, and I realized working with him professionally that no, it's just his job is to be a comedy writer. And I never really had bad dad jokes growing up. Really? You feel like... I like this one. Yeah. How many strings on a banjo? I don't know. How many strings? Five too many. <laughs> <laughs> so I love that. I love like Nate's, Nate's in therapy. And it's like, well, my problem was my dad, he was too good a comic. Yeah, that, that's... You're missed not, out on having lame incorrect. dad jokes. Yeah, I, I, I'll say that like it's that that was actually a bigger revelation than you would think it would be. Is that wow, you know, I, all, all of my friends are complaining about our embarrassing dads and all that stuff, and my dad's my dad's hilarious. <laughs> my well, dad was thanks. embarrassing. It's crazy. I, don't know where your dad I mean, was. I, 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 oh, do, uh, <laughs> I do a lot of annoying stuff. I do a lot of annoying stuff um, to defend myself against being considered good. Um, uh, I, I am very distracted. I'm often reading a book and the newspaper and listening to a book and your podcast and uh, then having a conversation. <laughs> and that is really hard uh, sometimes. I, I, um, the other thing is, I, I think I got when I was doing Mr. Show, I got good at working with young writers like and getting good stuff out of them. And part of that is from working at Saturday Night Live where at the time I was there, I felt like they weren't getting the best out of us because there was such a com competitive scenario going on all the time. Um, and I, when I went to Mr. Show and I had young writers, 23, 24 year old people coming in with rough stuff, you know, I was able to chill out, ask what was good about that, pursue the good part, and and so I think I got fairly good at, you know, having someone bring an idea to me that's new and, um, and helping find the best part of it without making them feel like shit. And, but the hardest part is this, is that it can be hard to tell when the mistakes mistakes of a young writer are bad writing and when they're an opportunity for a different point of view, right? So especially as you get older and your brain gets these like patterns settled into it about what a sketch is and you can kind of quickly go, uh-huh, uh-huh, that's the idea. Oh, no, I know what to do. I know what to do. Actually, that don't make it that way. Do this. Here's the joke. Do it this way. Here's the end. And your brain just kind of races to an ending. Uh, because you've just done it so many times. And then, of course, what you'll lose potentially is a different way uh, forward with that piece that maybe is more unique, more interesting, and maybe even you could say comes from a clumsiness that you then embrace. And um, in rewriting these poems, the one I just read later, that's the most like Seuss rhymes in the whole book. Nothing else in this book has such a um, such a steady, exacting kind of unstopping rhyme scheme. Everything else has a a left turn in the middle, or it stops, you know, and shifts its uh, rhyme palette. And I think that's cool. I wanted it to be that. I want people to read this and go, I could do that with my kids. Let's do that. We could do a poem that good. And, uh, you know, so anyway, those were the challenges for me. But I'll tell you how they, what they showed me. Erin, as a young person, was way too much of a per perfectionist. She would w always turn in her school projects late 
almost because she needed them to be Catch the almost. She they needed were... almost. The, the very last second, she would be working way too hard and she'd feel terrible. Then she'd get an A. You know, and she was able to, in the process of this, chill out on the perfectionism, find her way through a, a drawing, uh, discovering what it should be. And you forget that your kids are growing up and that they're evolving and that they will continue to. And it was wonderful to see her show me that side of herself. And Nate, who, when he was young, I went to him one time, he was going to sleep and I was gonna go do stand-up. And uh, I was putting him to bed and he looks at me and he goes, when I grow up, I'm not gonna do comedy. <laughs> and, and I said, okay, why not? And he goes, you work too hard. Because <laughs> he knew I was leaving to go do stand-up. And I go, oh no, no you don't. I go, you'll see, there are other jobs that work way harder. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, so when he finally decided, look, I love doing comedy, and in junior high he started a newspaper, and a comedy newspaper, and he was always going to do this. And uh, when I saw him embrace that, and, and I saw that he had done, he's done so much, waking up, sitting down, writing that he is not as precious about his material, which you have to get to, you know? Yeah. And that was wonderful to see in this uh, process of making this book. Nate, you want to chime in on that question? Yeah, what was the question? Uh, well, I, I, I have it written me? down. Uh, the question was uh, from Alicia, yeah. who's here with us today. Uh, what is it that you learned about your father as, an, as, as, as you being an adult uh, as, and as a peer that surprised you? I think that, um, yes? Oh, oh, sorry. That was a baby. Um, I think yeah, you're, you're very good at what you do. Oh, you're very good. I'll take that. Yeah. yeah. And I, 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 I don't think that was necessarily a surprise, but getting to see that up close, of course there's challenges associated with that, but, you know, uh, but it w it's been great. It's been really great. I'll say, I'll say that, yeah. Okay. We're, we're, we're coming to the end, and I actually have two questions that actually come out of, not this book, but Bob's memoir, Comedy, Comedy, oh, Comedy, yeah. Drama. And in, the first one involves the family. Yeah. Uh, you tell this story, and I was somewhat stunned by it, but I wanted to ask about it. And since you can't talk about it, maybe I can. Uh, you had created this character, or helped create this character, Saul Goodman or Breaking Bad, conversations about maybe doing a spin-off show about him started, you say, almost immediately after Breaking Bad came to a close. It became realer and realer until the creators of the show, Vince Gilligan and Peter Gould, had actually come up with a sincere and real proposal to do this show, Better Call Saul. They even got the, you know, the sign off, the green light, to go ahead and do it, and they called you up, and they said, we're doing it. We're on it. Let's go. And you said, no. no. Yeah. And why did you say no? Uh, well, so when they first talked to me about doing a show, which was a few months after Breaking Bad ended, um, they said, we have no idea what it is or where it shoots. It could be a half-hour comedy. It could be a one-hour procedural where every week Saul has a new client and he never goes to court. He settles it out of court by manipulating <laughs> the judge the, Wouldn't everybody. that be great? That's a good idea. Uh, that's a great a idea. a different client every week. It's a great idea. Um, too bad he's in jail for the rest of his life. Um, Spoiler. <laughs> um, okay. Um, good thing I caught up with the damn show before tonight. <laughs> anyway. Um, so in the course of talking about whether there would be a show, I mean, they might have shot it in L.A. and I could have driven down the street to work. Um, the kids were 13 and 15 at the time. Um, and when they called to say we want to do the show, and then they said it's a drama and we're shooting it in Albuquerque, and it's a one hour drama. Then I was like, well, uh, I have to go live there. Uh, and there's still just tons of stuff going on at home. I mean, driving to every kind of driving thing. to school, driving know. from school. Yeah, I mean, et cetera. Just, and yeah. Naomi, my wife, runs a management company and it's a 
big one, and it's a lot of work. I mean, it's tons of work. And I was just like, ah, maybe two years from now, I could do it. So it was, I, I don't think I was as intimidated by the drama aspect, which I probably should have been, because when I got the scripts, I was like, oh, geez, Louise, this is a lot more acting than I've ever done. <laughs> this is like... It's acting. That's right. It's, I'm going to have to act for the first time in my life. And um, I just said, we can't do it. We can't do it. And so it was a Friday night. My manager, Mark Provisero, and he's Naomi's business partner. And Naomi took herself out of the co conversation. She said, Bob, do it if you want. We'll make it work. And if you don't want to do it, of course, you don't have to. I don't need you to do it and um and mark called me and said you know what do you say and i said no i can't do it i'm sorry and the fun part of the story is sunday morning so a day and a half not even a day and a half later i get a call on sunday morning sony called me do you really mean no is it a real no or is this just is a it ploy no, is it just yes pronounced weirdly yes <laughs> no and i'm on the phone and Nate is standing over by the couch, and I need to drive him somewhere in a little bit. Actually, we were going to go get burritos. So it wasn't a rush, but I had told him, we'll go. And I'm on the phone, and I'm like, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really no. I really just can't do it. There's just too much going on here. And so I just don't think uh, I can do it. So it's a real no. And I hung up, and he says... So you're not going to do that show, huh? And I go, no, I'm not. And he goes, well, you're going to disappoint a lot of people. <laughs> and I said, because I'd thought about this, I said, well, I'm going to disappoint a lot of strangers. <laughs> and he said, well, some of them are my friends. Nate, is this all, is this accurate? Yeah, that's right, that's right. All right, all right, so that's the first blow, and, so and then what? so we get in the car, and we drive to get the burrito, and we talk. And I go, I just don't think our family is ready for it. I would have to leave. And he goes, well, I'll help out. I promise you, I understand, you know, we'll help, and we'll make it okay, and you should do that. So that's that. And then later in the day, and this is why I said no, I'm driving Erin <laughs> to something she has to do. And she goes, Dad, Nate said you're not going to do that TV show. And then this shows you a ch Hollywood childhood with a manager mom. She starts asking me questions like, um, if it's a bad show, how bad would it be? <laughs> and I said, it really wouldn't be bad. I mean, the worst it would be would be an experiment, a worthy experiment. That's the worst it's going to be with these writers. And we talk about some other aspects, more questions like a manager would ask, you know, like, uh, would, would you get paid a lot? And uh, would, a lot, would it be, um, could it be good? And how could it help you? Would it expand your range? <laughs> you know, like, this is growing up in childhood right. in, in Hollywood. And this is, I'm just checking in with Erin. Right. She's here. We and, happen and, to have Erin. This is all go, true. Okay. And, and she goes, well, I think you should do it. And Nate and I will help out at home, and it'll be okay. We talked with Mark uh, and Sony, <laughs> and we were like, look, we got to get this guy to do a yes. What can we do? What does it take? We upped the offer. We turned the heat up on him, and I think it worked. So on, so, so on Monday morning... I'm like, I'm gonna do it. I feel like the kids both had a, in a mature way said, we're willing to be a part of this challenge. And, um, and on Monday morning, I'm not in a rush to call him. And I get a call from Mark and he goes, Sony called, they upped the offer. <laughs> yeah. Did they, get a, did they get any percentage of that? I mean. No. No. Yeah, not yet, no. And uh, I go, well, all right, they didn't need to, but I'm doing it. And, and how was it? I mean, you were as, it was, you were guys were as cool as you thought you would be? Mostly, yeah. I mean, it was difficult, and there were a lot of, like, 20-year-old type interns picking us up from school instead of my dad. But sometimes that was nice when you're 13 and 14 and you want to break 
There are a lot of FaceTimes and he came home every weekend he could and we went and visited him and I have so many memories in New Mexico now and I love that place and I would never have had that experience. Yeah, he worked, And no, we I got agree. a dog because he left and the dog changed <laughs> our lives. Our lives were changed by this dog. You got a we dog because like your dad is going to be gone for months at a time to replace him in your hearts. Equivalent. Was, was it a nice dog? Was it a big dog? Oh, it was a me was the medium. very medium-sized dog. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I... Was it a funny dog? I mean, how well did he do oh, taking funny. his place? Mostly physical humor from her. All right. But yes, a, just I'll, a... I'll show you a picture the greatest. of that dog, because she's in this book, of course. <laughs> of course. Uh, where is Olive? Olive she's, the... she's at home right now, and she's uh, really a great, my favorite... Person. Favorite child. Favorite member of the family. I get called Olive a lot. <laughs> He'll be talking to me like, yeah, yeah, yeah whatever, Olive. <laughs> okay. okay, let me find her. Anyway, she's under uh, page 69. You can see the dog. Uh, but yeah, so it's really true. They got my favorite dog in the world uh, while I was gone. <laughs> that dog. Aww, that's a good dog. If you can see her. Anyway, um, we're, we're already over time. All right. And, you know, there's some other oh. genius who needs to come in and use the stage. I'm going to read this. But I think there's an improv team coming up in I 15 think so. minutes. Probably. Well, that's it. I actually, uh, and this is the second question, and I know you want to finish with a, a reading of a poem, which we will do. I, one of the things I did not know about you before I read your memoir was how much you were a Chicago guy. I mean, obviously, I knew yeah. you grew up in Naperville, but I did not know that the early, you know, the early time, the early, what's the word? Most important early formative years, years, formative. That's the word I couldn't think of were here in Chicago. In fact, I found out amazingly you were writing for Saturday Night Live and then coming back to Chicago in the weekends to yeah. do shows. Yeah. So as, as briefly as you can, because we are over time, could you talk about what Chicago, because we're in Chicago, or <laughs> Chicago adjacent. Yeah. What, what it meant. And, well, and, it's a good question, and I often think about that, and I have thought about it. I think a lot of funny people come from Chicago and the Midwest, and a big part of that is the chip on our shoulder, <laughs> which is real good, man. It's a good thing to have. The second city. Who calls themselves that? <laughs> they don't do that in New York or L.A. They would never do that. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a underdog attitude. Uh, it's a tough attitude. It's a cynical, uh, critical attitude. <clears throat> My mom had it. Super Catholic, sweet lady. But she was taking everything down a peg all the time. And it was fun and funny. It made me laugh. And it was the point of view that I think comes from this part of the country and I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud it is a part of me. And the weirdest thing about this whole experience is when I was young, I didn't think I was a Chicagoan. Uh, it was only when I left here that I realized, oh yeah, I'm a Chicagoan. <laughs> and I'm, I, I, I'm very proud to be. So you guys wanna- Oh yeah. Let's do it. I, I'm gonna need a copy. Peter, you're gonna do us a favor. I'm gonna Let's hear it for Peter. We so appreciate him hosting tonight. It means a lot. Uh, so, and, so this is a poem, and and the Odenkirks have asked me to to recite it in in sort of in partnership with Nate. Um, and you my gave pleasure. me instructions of how it's supposed to work, and it completely went over my head. Except so every other, line. every other line. Okay, here we go. This is called this is called the pledge. Let me not stand in front of Bob here. Okay. So you're going to start yeah, there, yeah, and then we yeah, pick up yeah. here, right? You, take this pledge with me, so friends we may always be. I, you, pledge hereby to be good and kind, not sneaky or sly, to play fair and not cheat, and ne'er to lie, and to put on clothes before I go outside. And if I must fart a whopper someday, I shall wipe your tears completely, completely away. I'm sorry, that was your line. That was fine. I... I shall skip beside you, 
pick you up if you fall. And answer the phone with gobble gobble. Whenever you call. And tip my cap to you. And jump in the lake with you. And if I bake a bunt cake. Make enough bunt for two. I heretofore swear. To you and me both. To stand by and to honor. This grandiloquent quoth. Oath. The Odin Kirks, everybody. <laughs>